we're going to go to, first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 3, and then I hope to get to Acts chapter 9, and then Romans chapter 1. But I want you to take a look here in 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. For in other words, there uh, didn't seem like God was manifesting himself like he had in the past. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, the fire went out. That lamp was supposed to be lit 24 hours a day, and that was one of his jobs. Where the lamp of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. And verse 4, and the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. So the voice of God is reaching out to Samuel, calling out to Samuel. Samuel's a young boy, don't know how old he was, and he says, Lord, here am I. That's 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 5. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again, and he went to lay down again. In verse 6, And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose. So Samuel's hearing the voice of God but he just doesn't know it's God calling him. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. So I want you to get this picture. Samuel, up to this moment, didn't know God, but God is calling out to him. God is reaching out to him. God is speaking to him. God is knocking on the door of his heart. So God's reaching out to him. Neither, listen, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. <coughs> so Samuel hasn't had no revelation of who God is. He's, he was, yeah, he's there. And of course, we know why he's there, because his mother had asked God for a child and God gave her a child, and she dedicated Samuel to the Lord. So Samuel's there, but he doesn't, he's just there. He's just there. And I'm going to read that again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. So if you study this, it would imply that this is not the first time that God had been calling out to Samuel, but this is the first time that Samuel heard God reach out. I'll, I'll talk tonight about how God is reaching out to humanity. You know, God, God is constantly reaching out to humanity. God wants to rescue humanity. God wants to save humanity. God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So God is, you know, in the book of Revelation, he said, and he's talking to the church now. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So from the very beginning, God has always been reaching out to man in his, whether it be in his unconverted condition or his backslidden condition. God is reaching out. God is speaking. God is moving. Uh, I think about after Adam and his wife committed sin, and they heard the voice of God, and Adam and his wife went and hid himself, and it says, and God called out, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? So God is constantly reaching out to us. 
Uh, and it says, And the Lord came and stood and called him as other times to Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. So I want you to notice when God begins to reach out to us and speak to us and reveal himself to us, and we're going to talk about the numerous ways that God does this, uh, when we respond to his voice, then he begins to reveal himself to us. But we need to respond to his voice. And you can ignore him. We've all done it at times because we didn't really want to hear what God had to say because we were so caught up in what our flesh wanted or desired. And sometimes it's not even sin. It's just that we want to live our lives the way we want. But God is there. God is reaching. God is calling. God is speaking. The God of heaven and earth, the God who created all things. And so Samuel, he responds. He says, yes, Lord. Now listen. And the Lord said to Samuel, now he's going to be given, give him a prophetic word. Behold, I will do a new thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him, I have told him, for in other words, God has been speaking to Eli. Eli knows what's wrong in his life but he refuses to deal with it. And this is connected to his two sons. His two sons were extremely immoral and ungodly and wicked, and they were using their position of their father being the high priest to their advantage and taking advantage of the people in, in numerous immoral ways. And, and, and Eli had been warned by God. Now, I'm not really getting into that tonight, but, but listen, uh, judgment doesn't just come. God will warn us again and again. Matter of fact, in the book of Job, it says, And the Lord speaks, yea, once, yea, twice to man in the deep, uh, deepness of his sleep, that he might turn him away from destruction, and yet men hearken not to the voice of God. So there's lots, you know, in, in the medical world, there's all kinds of symptoms that you can have in your body that's kind of a warning sign that there's something wrong, wrong inside of your body and that you need to do something about it. Listen, it, 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 I look back over my walk with God, and there was all kinds of warning signs that were going on in my marriage, in my finances, in my decisions I was making, and uh, we just harden our hearts, and then tragedy comes, and then God gets to blame. But God's not your problem. God wants to rescue you. God wants to help you. you. You think about, and really, Christ is God reaching out to man, isn't he? Isn't Jesus reaching out? That's God. Matter of fact, he said that he could find no one to make up the hedge or stand in the gap, and so he sent his mighty right arm. God sent his son, and, and, and Jesus, he said, I come to seek, I come to seek and save the lost. And Jesus said this, no man can come to the Father, except the Father draw him. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. We, we all came to God because God reached out to us. God called us. Now, a major way that God reaches people, it tells us in Romans, is by the preaching of the gospel. By the preaching of the gospel. How beautiful out of the feet of them that preach the glad tidings of good news. And so there's a lot of people, the only, and, and I think God spoke to them most of their life. They, they just, you know, you harden your heart, you ignore him, uh, you won't listen to him, and, 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 and then you get in a terrible mess. And then, of course, we got a lot of confused Christians because they would teach you that every, everything, everything that happens in your life is ordained of God, and that's just a lie. Jesus exposed the devil in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And uh, so there's, you know, a lot of times even, I'll say this, even with our physical body, sometimes it, it is a warning from God that you need to change your lifestyle. Really, sometimes you need to change your diet. You, you need to change, you know, uh, a lot of times when people have mental issues, it's because they got to change what they're taking into their minds, 
into their hearts and our lives. It's God speaking to us in many different ways. And it says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. He, he knows. Eli knew. He knew, he knew better. He, he raised his sons wrong. And I'm sorry to say that Samuel was so influenced by Eli's upbringing of his boys, he, he did almost the same mistake that Eli did with his sons. Maybe not to the same extent, but he, he did mess up. Because his sons made themselves vile, <clears throat> and he did not restrain them. You, you know, it, it's a weird time. We're living in a time where people got it into their silly heads that you don't restrain your children from doing what's wrong. You know, I say this in love, my older brother Dennis, you know, I led him to Christ. He's four years older than me, and he had two sons and two daughters. And he basically told me, I'm going to let my kids make their own decisions of whatever they want to do. And I said, Dan, that, Dennis, that's insanity. E even, even a young tree, how many of you ever had a young fruit tree? You put a stick next to it, right? You drive a stick in, and you tie that tree up to the stake. Why? Because you want that tree to grow straight. Now, I'm not talking about being dictators. Uh, and that's what you do with children. You, you, if you don't show them how to live and give them direction and understanding, somebody else is going to mess them up. So I raised my children. My children didn't tell me what they wanted to eat. I made them eat. And, and, and now my children love everything. All, they love vegetables. You know, I, I mean, we've had children. I remember one year we took this, uh, this young buck out with us to eat to an all-you-could-eat restaurant, and that wasn't cheap. And, and you all know the Flickingers. I'm not picking on DJ. DJ was this little guy. He's a big guy now. And he went there, and he got a bowl, and he scooped up all of the, um, the uh, what, what are they, uh, macaroni and cheese. I mean, he piled the macaroni and cheese like a mountain. And I said to him, what, what, what about the broccoli? What about the cauliflower? What about this? And he looked at me like I had lost my mind, you know. He, he want, just wanted junk, you know. Well, Eli did that to some extent with his kids. He just, he just let them live how they wanted to live. And, and, and you know what? It's, it's hard when somebody has been raised in a position but first of all, children don't have the wisdom you do. You know, I, I mean, I hate to say this. I wish my parents would have never let sugar in, in the house. And my, kid, my, my parents, they brought junk food in my house, and I've had to pay the price for it with my teeth ever since. I mean, that, that sugar will eat your teeth away like it's acid. And th these are natural things, but spiritual things, you know, I, I never really quote-unquote let a lot of stuff in my house that a lot of people did when I was raising my kids, and so I, I never had the problem with my children like a lot of people have had with their children. And it wasn't because I harped on them or anything else. I selected what they should watch and, and things, and, and praise God for that. And he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel uh, lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, and he answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the thing that the Lord has said unto me? I pray thee, hide it not from me, God, do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me, all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And for in other words, Samuel told Eli the truth. And, you know, tonight as we are in prayer with uh, Brother Gary and his wife Wanda, we were talking along this line. We as pastors, we should tell the truth whether people like it or not. We should tell the whole truth. And uh, that's why on Thursday night I preached about the reality that hell is, in hell there's the worm that never dieth and the fire that's never quenched. And we need to tell people the whole truth. Whether, it be, whether, whether they're say, well, I'm, I'm just going to get away from you people, or they stay. That's up to them. And we do it in love, speaking the truth in love. Okay? And so he left, he, he, and, 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 he, and he said, it is the Lord. So Samuel told him, now listen, let him do what seemeth good. What in the world? Eli, didn't you just hear what God said through that young man? 
See, Eli, God spoke to you personally. He spoke to your heart. And, and God said, you knew better, Eli. And you wouldn't listen, so now God is going to speak through the mouth of a child. He'll speak through the mouth of a donkey, right? When, when it, when it, when, remember that? When God spoke through the mouth of the donkey to that prophet, Balaam? And um, because God really wants to reach you. So God, he's going to go way out of his way to reveal his will to you because he really doesn't want something bad happen to you. He, he really designed you to live with him forever. But Eli, his attitude is not so lot. Oh, well, whatever happens, happens. What, what, what is that? Really? Whatever happens, happens? Why don't, Eli, why don't you just admit you miss God and begin to take steps to get it right? Because, you know, the problem is sometimes we get into such a deep rut, we just kind of like, oh, whatever. No, no, it can't, it can't be that way. Eli, Eli, you should have repented. Eli, you should have wept. You should have cried. You should have humbled yourself. You should have put on sackcloth and ashes like David did, right? David acknowledged, I messed up, God. I'm the bad dude. Saul, Saul's at, God, God said to Saul, he said, man, he said, uh, I'm going to find some, I'm going to find someone after my own heart. You, you've got it in your stubborn head that you're taking your position as king and you're going to be a dictator and do what you want. And you know what? All that Saul was concerned about was how the people looked upon him. He said, Samuel, come out here and let the people, you know, let me, let them think that you still approve of me. It was all about reputation. It's, it's, it's about, no, it's about eternity. So if God is speaking to you, if God is, how many ever had a, 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 in the old, we used to call them idiot lights on your old dashboards. Remember your old idiot lights? And you should listen to the idiot lights. So when your oil pressure drops, I was driving an F-254 pickup and I had been around engines long enough, my oil pressure dropped, boom. I knew right away my fuel pump had gone bad and dumped my oil pan full of water. I knew it. So how many of you guys knew that? So I turned off my engine. I coasted to a stop. Thank God I was right because when I took my dipstick out and it was full of water and uh, full of gas, not made water, but gas, full of gas, not full of water. And so I was able to, otherwise, if I would have just said, oh, well, and kept on driving, I would have gone another mile and my engine would have froze up on me. But that, 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 that warning sign. So when you begin to see there's problems in your marriage, you, you need to stop. You need to stop. You know, I, uh, I, I almost pushed our marriage to a point of destruction. If I wouldn't have had a godly woman, I would have lost her, see. And God, God tries to warn us. God, God, and, and God would give you visions, and God would give you dreams, and God will, I mean, God's done that to me. I've got one book where 60 times, 60 times, what, 60, 60, and they're in my book, and I tell you the times and the dates and the places that either I would have died or my wife would have died or my kids would have died or a terrible disaster would happen. Sometimes we don't listen, though. So one day I was in prayer, and Mikey had just been born. He was about maybe, oh, about a week old, and we're going to go up to Huntington to just have his, his and they were just going to look at him, the medical world. And I was praying that morning. I heard the Lord, never heard this before, never heard it again. I heard the Lord say, the devil's going to try to kill you in a car accident this morning. I, I heard him. I wasn't imagining it. So I told Kathy, well, we prayed and I, I, I believed, but I didn't, I didn't believe right. N number two, I did two things wrong. It was raining that morning. Number, number one, I said, you're not going to hurt my wife or my, my child or myself. And, 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 but I didn't say, and you're not going to have us, you're not going to have us have a car accident. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You got to speak to it. You're not going to, we're not going to have a car in Jesus' name. And then I was driving too fast in the rain. I wasn't being crazy, but I was driving faster. And we're up through the mountains, and this big feed truck comes around the corner on our side of the road. And I swerved to miss him in our Ford Granada, uh, 1975 Ford Granada, I think it was, and just barely got around him. And then I lost control, and we went down the road sideways. Well, here there was a big drop-off like a small cliff with no guardrail, and over it we went, spinning. Ended up down. Now listen, though. So in them days, we didn't have to have a child seat. Michael, he's flying through the air. I mean, it's supernatural. 
Kathy, I watch her in slow motion reach up and grab Michael by the neck and by the rump and pull him into her chest. And then we ended up on our side in a little river down below and, and amongst all these big rocks. It was a miracle, first of all, that not one window got broke. But we're in there. Michael's not even crying. The peace of God is so thick you could cut it with a knife. I mean, it's like we were sitting in that car turned up on its side, and it was like heaven in that car. But see, God spoke to me, and I believe if I had not listened and taken authority and said, devil, you're not going to harm my wife, my child, or myself in Jesus' name, who knows what would have happened. You mean God really expects that? Yes, God wants you to, to take authority and, 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 and to use that authority against the devil. So another day, uh, I, I, I could tell you a story, but up on the hill, we, I had a homemade uh, swimming pool, 20 foot, 24 foot, and I had bought, and I had it down here, and I took it up on the hill, and I took a bunch of pine wood, slat pine wood, and what I did is I, I, I slipped them all together, created a circle, and I put two big steel cables around, and then I insulated and put the uh, swimming pool liner in there, you know, because I'm always trying to find a way to, to, to save money, you know, and one day, Kathy's up there now, and I had put sand underneath it. Unbeknownst to me, it got a leak, and the, the water began to wash because I had to use sand. How many know sand's not a good foundation on the side of a hill? I mean, it's a tall hill. Kathy calls me up and said, honey, something doesn't look right in that swimming pool. And just like a divine urgency hit me, get them out. Kathy, get them out of the pool right now, right now. So Kathy runs out to the pool, and usually they don't listen real good. Stephen and Stephanie are there and said, come here, come here. And right away, they obeyed her, right away. And, and either Stephanie got out first. And the, the moment my wife pulled the last child out, that cable slipped. And the whole pool was like a gigantic serpent spun around over 12,000 gallons of water and went down the, the steep, steep hill into the road and flooded the road below. Now, if my kids would have been in there, they would have got either very seriously hurt or died. And if Kathy had gone in front of the pool and said to the side, she would have gone with them. But see, there was this urgency. I heard God. God is speaking. God is drawing. God is quickening. God is, you know. And how many of you know what I'm talking about? You've had experiences where I got to do something right now. And, but Eli, he's hard in his heart. Oh, well, whatever happens, happens. And... Um, uh, and, his, and, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Um, so Samuel came to the place where he learned the voice of God as a child, and he began to hearken to the voice of God. Uh, I think a lot of times when, when we die, we're going to find out how many times God was really trying to speak to us. I, I, was, a, I was a stinker as a little boy. Uh, I was very tormented. Uh, I, first of all, I had uh, tremendous pressure in my head because of my ears and had lung problems. And uh, my daddy did spoil me, uh, called me after himself, Mike, Michael. And, but, but, and, and matter of fact, my mom one time said to me, he said, I think you're the devil himself. And uh, I went into the bathroom. I got up on the sink. You got to be careful what you say to children. And I would run my hand through over my forehead, and I was sure I could feel the lumps on my head of the horns coming out of my head. And uh, after that happened, I, I really, I went off the wall and uh, almost uncontrollable. Now my dad didn't put up with anything. My dad would, my, I never back talked my dad and none of us kids did. My, my dad wouldn't put up with it, you know? And uh, he wasn't, he, I wouldn't say my dad was brutal or nothing. He just, when my dad said, hey, empty the sun, the garbage son, you'd empty the garbage. He said, clean up your room. You, you, he was just, and my mom was in agreement with him. So if you don't got a mom and a dad who are both, both disciplinarians, you're going to have hell in your home. And, uh, but my mom agreed with that. But I remember one, it was like in, in the wintertime, we had snow in Wisconsin. I got to go to the restroom and I went into the bathroom and I went to the bathroom and then I washed my hands because that's what I was taught. And I turned around and we had a perforated milk window that you couldn't really see clear out. We lived in a little box, two bedroom box house. My brother and I lived in the basement. But anyways, I looked out, the sun, the moon was shining and uh, on the snow and I looked out and I saw three crosses. I saw three crosses. And in the middle cross, there was blood coming off of it. 
as a little seven-year-old boy, it broke my heart. I began to weep, weep. I knew in my heart that was Jesus on that cross. And if my mom surely was so alive, she'd tell you that, that for two, at least two weeks, I was a little different boy. I mean, I'm doing dishes without being told. I'm being nice to, to Dennis and to Debbie. I mean, I was transformed, but that was God reaching out to me as a seven-year-old boy. But I hardened my heart, and before I got saved, I became worse than ever. But now when I got saved on my 19th birthday, it was God reaching out to me when the blanket of the fear of the Lord fell on me, and I knew that I knew that I knew I was going to hell undeserved hell. I belonged in hell. And uh, even I was raised in Catholicism, they didn't teach me that. But I did believe who Jesus was. Now look there in the book of Acts chapter 9, please. God is always reaching out to us. When, when, when Jesus, there was a day that came that Jesus, he stood before Jerusalem and he wept. He wept, he wept. He said, how many times, how many times, he said, I would have uh, drawn you to myself like a mother hand does his chicks, but you would not, like Eli, you would not listen to me. He said, therefore, your house is left to you desolate. You've missed your day of visitation. And then he gave the prophetic word where he said the day will come when they're going to come and they're going to destroy Jerusalem. They're going to destroy the temple and they're going to slaughter you. And, and the day came. Now, the God didn't want that to happen, but God kept giving them warning after warning after warning. But they, and, and he sent Jesus to reveal the Father. Matter of fact, Jesus said, if the miracles I've done here had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented a long time ago. But see, they had a religious spirit about them. For in other words, Jesus was saying that the immoral city of Sodom and Gomorrah would have been redeemed if I did what I've done in the midst of you, but... But you, you, here you are. You know, I think about the ten lepers. Only one responded. I mean, everybody that Jesus healed, that was God the Father reaching out to them to wake them up, to draw them to him, for they, he could heal them. He could save them. You know, Jeremiah many times and many of the prophets of old, they gave a lot of prophetic words of God saying, Oh, I want to help you. I want to bless you. I want to save you. I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. I want to. I, I, I want. I want you at my side. I want you to be one. But they refused to listen. They hardened their hearts, and then peace, peace, and sudden destruction. And I, we. I, I think we all know a lot of tragic stories of people who just want to listen to God. So here, here, here we've got Saul, you know, I mean, the devil's using Saul. He, he, he really is probably one of the most knowledgeable uh, Pharisees of that day and age. And he saw that what Jesus, listen, he saw that what Christianity was teaching was going to literally do away with uh, all of what, Basically, the, the Levitical laws taught. I'm talking about feast days, holy days, circumcision, customs, animal sacrifices, uh, all, everything that Jewish culture had been built on for the last couple thousand years, that what, what the Christians were teaching was going to do away with all of that. And guess what? He was right. Because Jesus came to fulfill all of that. Didn't need it no more. Jesus came to fulfill it, and he, he said, don't think for a moment I've come to abolish the law, but I come to fulfill it, and, and Saul of Tarsus saw that. He, he saw that. He said, man, what, what they're teaching, that this Jesus is a Passover lamb, and that he died, and he rose again, and because Jesus never taught none of that stuff. They already had plenty of that teaching. Jesus never taught what we call the Sabbath days, the holy days, the new moon days, the, the, the sacrifices and all of the customs and traditions of the book of Leviticus. He followed them, but he fulfilled it. And Saul of Tarsus saw this. Now, Saul said he did it ignorantly in unbelief, and therefore God had mercy on him. And Saul yet, in, in Acts 9, verse 1, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went into the high priest. 
and desired him that he give him letters. And he did give him letters. In verse 3, and he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly, say suddenly, there shine around about him a light from heaven. And this is how God speaks, that, that, that God will speak to us suddenly, mysteriously a lot of times. Uh, he just shows up in our life. Aren't you glad that God just shows up in our life? Listen, the day I got born again, I wasn't looking to get born again. But like I said, God reaches out to us through people, doesn't he? God reaches out to us through circumstances. God reaches out. You know, I, I, I know that, that when you get a terminal illness, that it's terrible. It's terrible. But I, I, I tell you the truth, I've seen it to be a wake-up call of a lot of people to get their hearts right with Jesus. I have led, I can't tell you how many people to the Lord that got terminal diseases and God was nowhere in their thoughts, nowhere in their heart, nowhere in their mind. And uh, I, I tell you that down here, Dale Arnold at A&A Auto Savage, God laid that man on my heart and uh, him and his son Dennis, Dennis still runs it. And I, I, probably Dale was probably an old enough to be my father. And I'd go down there and I'd just hang around and I'd share Jesus. They put, put up with it, so I'd just go down and share Jesus. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done for me. And I just, and one day I got a call from Daryl, Dale, and he called me up. And he was real upset. He said, Mike, he said, something was going on in my body. I went to the doctors. They told me I'm full of cancer. He said, I'm so full of cancer, they can't help me. What do I do, Mike? And I said, okay, this is what you're going to do, Dale. And praise God, he listened to me. I said, come on up here. I said, we're going to pray for you. We're going to believe God for a miracle and, and get you born again. Okay, what does that mean? I said, come up. So I led him to the Lord, led him to the Holy Ghost, and he started feeling really good. He went back, and the medical world told him, hey, uh, that, that cancer is in, in total remission, but, but they insisted on giving him chemo and radiation. His kids were full of fear. They didn't want him to die, and so they convinced him, you know, and, and the radiation and the chemo got him. But, but see, that was a wake-up call for Dale, and thank God Dale responded and gave his heart to Christ. And I went to see him the day he died, because I'd go over there and lay hands on him and anoint him with oil all the time. And, and certain people, God's going to lay on your hearts for you to minister to. Uh, you're, I'm, you're, 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 everybody has their assignment. You all know what I'm saying? You have your assignment. And so I went down there with about three brothers from the church, and he was laying on his couch, lost all of his hair, and Dale looked at me and said, Mike, he said, I'm just really tired. I want to go be home with Jesus. And I cried. And I said, okay, Dale. I said, I'll see you on the other side. And that day he went home to be with Jesus. But he was born again. See that? So what the devil meant for evil, attacking with cancer, God woke him up. But how many people never did wake up except when they woke up on the wrong side? So God is reaching. God is speaking. God is calling. And so God reaches out to Saul, and he's journeying, and suddenly uh, there's a, 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 a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice. Here it is, saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. For in other words, God had been dealing with this heart. This ain't something new. I think, I think when he said against the pricks, he's talking about all the other Christians. He saw Stephen martyred and he saw Stephen shining like an angel he said Lord into thy hands command I my spirit so he he seen saw, saw and in the midst of persecuting the church he had seen God upon these people but he had hardened his heart but this is how good God is God went the extra mile see God goes the extra mile it's amazing even with people that God knows will never believe, they will never accept, they will never embrace. God still goes the extra mile. Say, Lord, go the extra mile for me. Prodigal son in a pig pen, lost everything, going to die, starving to death. And all of a sudden, God reaches out to him, knocks on the door of his heart, and this time he opens the door. It, it's, it's amazing to me. How God, I'm so glad that God kept reaching out to me in my sin, in my immorality, in the drugs, and all the filth I was in. Thank God. How many of you glad that God kept reaching out to you? And um, not that we deserved it. And there's many, many scriptures that, that talk about this. Um, uh, you know, here in Exodus, 
that when Moses, God, you know, Moses, he was called of God as, as a young man, and he tried to do it on his own. He couldn't do it. And so he goes out, and he becomes a shepherd, and 40 years later, he sees a fire. He sees a fire burning, and that's God speaking to him through the fire. So he turns aside, and the Bible says this in, in Exodus 3, 4, And when the Lord saw that, he turned aside to see, God called on to him out of the midst of the bush. And he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. God's reaching out. Now, sometimes it'll be an audible voice. I, I actually, I'm not exaggerating. I, I probably have had God speak to me at least a do, half a dozen times, if not more audibly. Now, and I didn't choose them. God would just, <laughs> one time me and Kathy were in that Granada. See, I got that Granada all fixed up, and I had it maxed out like a sports car, but it didn't have a sports car engine in it, you know. I think it was just a six-cylinder. And me and Kathy, we're heading to Mount Union, and I decided to put the pedal to the metal. Somebody was watching Michael, and I, I hit like 80, 90 miles an hour. And Kathy, she's over there, and she's praying, now, Lord, don't let me die with him because he's being stupid, God. Now, she ain't telling me not to. She ain't yelling at me. She's saying, she's praying. Now, God, don't let me die with him. I'm pulling you. I could take you to the stop sign. So there's a two, not my stop sign, but there's a stop sign to the left and right. I heard the audible voice of God, and this is this. He said, you're a dead man. I mean, I heard his audible voice. When I heard his audible voice, my wife would tell you, I slammed on the brakes of that car. I slammed them on. I mean, the fear of God hit me. And right, I didn't, and right then and there, here, a white, because it was a beautiful white Dodge Charger. It ran through his stop signs doing at least 80 miles an hour. If I had not slammed on my brakes, he would have hit me in my left door, and I would, do you think you would have gone to heaven? Yeah, but I, I went to heaven because I was stupid. Thank God that God reaches out to us, amen? It, it's a two-way communication here. God is speaking, God is calling, God is reaching. I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe with all my heart that God spoke to your heart and said, come to church tonight. I do. I believe God spoke. Quick. Now, it might not have been an audible voice. It might not have been a vision or something. It just might have been a quickening in your heart. Go to church tonight. And I wonder how many others have missed the voice of God. Now, if this place was packed out tonight with a lot of hungry people, desperate people, needy people, we would have had a lot of miracles here tonight. How many know that? You get hungry people together, God's going to show up. I mean, if people come together because they're hungry, God's going to be there. And that's why in, in the old Kent Bibles, when Jack Cole or A.A. A. Allen or uh, R.W. Schambach or Or Roberts, they, they heard the voice of God say to them, go to that tent meeting. No air conditioning, hot, you know, whatever. Else. Go to that. And guess what? They went and God showed up because they responded to the voice of God. Now, I believe you're going to get something here tonight. God's, God, God, you're only, you're only here because God spoke to you and you came. You came because you heard the voice of God. And um, uh, so in Ezekiel 34, 11, for thus saith the Lord, behold, I even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. Uh, Joel 2, 32, and it's come, come to pass that whosoever shall call her name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be delivered, says the Lord has said, and in a remnant whom the Lord shall call. See, God, many are called. Many are called, Jesus said, but few are chosen. What does that really mean? It means few choose to respond to the call. Every person in hell tonight, God reached out to them. God called them. God spoke to them, but they hardened their heart. So when God reached out to Saul of Tarsus, um, he responded. Aren't you glad you responded to the call of God? But now, it can't just be a one-time response. you, you got to respond to God every day. You've got to respond to the word. God's, God's word, this book we have is God, his love letter reaching out to you. God's word is telling us how to live, how to talk, how to walk, how to think, how to, how, how to run our marriages, how to raise our children, how to handle our finances, how, how to get healed. 
I mean, God's word is full of instructions. You know, what, what did the psalmist say? My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Uh, so God is constantly reaching out. Let, let's look there in Romans chapter 1. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Romans chapter 1. And God is constantly reaching. God is constantly speaking. God is constantly moving. God is, you know, I was in the Philippines one time and just out of the blue, in prayer. A lot of times God will speak to me in prayer. And he told me, he said, get out right now. A man has set you up to be murdered by the communist. <clears throat> I heard him. No fear. I said, okay. Okay, Lord, so we're going. So we flew back, me and Brian Showbaker flew back into Manila, and the guy picked us up, and he was, put, before you leave the Philippines, you're supposed to give him three days' notice. And I said to that pastor, I said, did you, did you let him know we're coming? He said, no, no, I, I, I didn't. He said, matter of fact, I've got meetings set up for you. I'm sitting in the back seat of his car. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, I've got meetings set up for you. Now, a lot of times, you just got to listen now. I'm listening. And... Uh, he said, I, I, I told him all, because he had been one of my servants, and I told him, I said, I'm not, a die, I'm not afraid to die for Christ. Well, he had gone around and spread that I wasn't afraid of the communists, and I wasn't afraid of them killing me. No, that wasn't the message. The message was, I'm not afraid to die. So he begins to talk about how, how he's been bragging in his community that I wasn't afraid of the communists. The red lights, and Brian Showbaker and I looked at one another and said, yep, he set us up to get murdered. And I said to the guy, I said, we're leaving tomorrow morning. I heard the Lord say, you're going to leave tomorrow. I heard the Lord say that to me. He's going to leave tomorrow. And uh, so I said, and, and he laughed. He said, you can't get out of here. You've got to have at least three days notice. I said, we're, number one, we're not doing those meetings for you. I didn't chew them out. I said, number two, we're leaving tomorrow. And he said, you, he, so he, he, he didn't get out of bed. I had to get him out of bed. I said, get us to the airport. And he argued with me. I said, get me to the airport. I'll get a taxi. So he got me to the airport with Brian. He said, I'm going to sit here and wait for you because you ain't going nowhere. I said, okay. So I got the cheapest tickets to go to the Philippines, Philippine Airlines. You know what I'm saying? And they make those chairs for Filipinos, you know, and it's a nightmare because the babies are crying and pooping. And I mean, by the time you fly all that distance, you about lose your mind, you know. You got to pray. So anyways, I went to their office and I told them, I said, I, I got to leave. We got to get out of here. And they said, well, they said, you got to give us three days notice. I said, no, we have to leave now. They said, well, why do you have to leave? I said, I can't tell you. I said, we just got to get out of here now. He said, hold on. And so I kept going up. Man I finally got me into this one manager's office where he had his own cubicle. He was big. And, and I, saw, I said, sir, I said, uh, we got to get out of here today because the Lord told me you're leaving today. And he said, sir, we, we, we can't do that because our airlines are. I said, I'm, I'm telling you. I wasn't ugly. I just said, sir. I said, we got it. So he got on the phone, began to make phone calls. And here he, 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 he got his tickets. On, he had to pay a lot more money on like uh, one, one of these uh, Southwest or some other airline, American Airlines. And praise God, we flew out that day. But I heard the voice of God. See, God spoke to me. So anyways, here in the book of uh, Romans, chapter 1, take, take a look down here as we get ready to close. Um, let's begin here because, I mean, Paul is speaking by the Spirit of God. And in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in other words, the gospel is God speaking. Right now, the gospel is God speaking to you. Right now, God is speaking to you. Whether you believe it or not, God is speaking to you by the word. He sent his word and he healed them. God is speaking. His heaven earth shall pass away. My word shall not pass away. You know, I just taught on uh, 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 Thursday night where the rich man said, uh, if you'll raise Lazarus from the dead and send him back, they'll listen. And, and, and Abraham said something powerful. He said, they've got the law and the prophets, and if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, though a man would be raised from the dead, they will not hearken. And we know that because God raised Christ from the dead, and yet people won't hearken. You, you got to hearken. You got to believe this is God speaking to you. And when you believe that this is God speaking to you, you're going to act on it. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. 
So there's a lot. And when I first got born again, when I picked up my Bible, and I had never read it up to then, and the military Bible, I began to read, and I read in the New Testament, and, I, and, I, and, and throughout the New Testament, and I saw lifting holy hands. So I, I, I did it. Okay, God must know what he's talking about. Lift your hands. He said, gather yourself together. I began to gather. He said, give to your money to the work of God. I, began, I just began to do it, and I found out it all works. I found out God knew what he was talking about. You know, my wife's so glad when I finally realized, because when I was 22 years old or 23, I memorized the whole book of Ephesians. And I, I memorized there where it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, you know, and says, uh, as Christ. And, and, but finally, in 2004, I began to believe that. <laughs> but it took me from 19, you know, 1980 to, to 2004 to finally believe that scripture and there's people here tonight, you don't still believe that scripture. You still don't believe you're supposed to love your wife like Christ loves the church. Yep. Yep. And so you end up having to pay the price because that's God talking to you. Reach up and grab that. That's God talking to you. You know, it's not someone else's opinion. It's God. God speaking. And so he goes on here and he says... Um, it's so powerful. Uh, I'm not ashamed. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as are in the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What, what, what do you mean hold the truth in unrighteousness? It's in the heart of every human being that there is a creator. But they don't want that. There is a maker. They don't want that. Why? Because they want to do what their flesh wants. Uh, because, listen, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it on to them. Oh, God has showed, how? By creation. The stars, the birds, the ocean life, the plants. God, God, God is speaking to everybody through, through nature. The sunrise, the sunset. You know, the Bible says God sends the heavy snow that men may stop and consider him. H have you ever, you know, I grew up in a place where there's a lot of snow. Have you ever, you know, like, it's like something like a blanket of heavy snow comes, and it's almost mystical. All the traffic stops. Everybody stops. Of course, now with technology, you can keep being foolish in your house, you know. But it says, God sends the heavy snow that men may consider him. God's trying to reach us. God is trying to speak. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and her fool's heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. For in other words, God was reaching them, but they just simply said, Kind of, you know, like just flipped your nose at God, just like, who cares? Like Eli, just, I don't. Well, okay, then you're going to have to pay the price. You know, uh, if, if you choose not to respond to the love of God, the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the warnings of God, I mean, what is God going to have to do? I mean, if you're not going to listen, what are you, what are you going to do? You've you're, 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 you got a rough road to haul. And pastoring for 47 years, I've seen a lot of it. I've seen a lot of people just, whatever, whatever. Huh. Marriages fall apart. Health falls apart. Finances fall apart. Their lives fall apart. And the, 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 the latter end is worse than the beginning. And uh, I, 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 you, you got to listen. As, as a child of God, you better listen to his voice. You, you better hearken. I'm telling you, many, many times I, I would have been dead if I didn't hear the voice of God. My kids will tell you one day, we're, we're back in 2007. I've got a fifth wheel trailer on the back of my Toyota pickup truck. I'm on I-35 West. We're going into Minneapolis, Minnesota. I had no idea construction was going on a main, on a main bridge over Mississippi River. I didn't know because, you know, I didn't know what was going on in, in Minneapolis. And all of a sudden, in my heart, it, it was a, 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 an urgency. Get off the highway. Get off the highway. 
I, I got to get across. I'm headed out, uh, you know, going towards, uh, I'm going to go out to Yellowstone uh, National Park. We're taking a vacation we'd never had before. And, and so I told my wife and kids, I said, I don't know what's going on. I never did that before. I said, we got to get off of this highway. Why, Dad? I don't know. There's something wrong. They said, Dad, do it. So I got the next road going north, cut, went up. As far as I had to go, there was another highway going across the Mississippi River. We went across it, pulled into a KOA with our camper, walked into the office. Everybody standing there staring at the TV. And right then and there, there was a bridge over the Mississippi River. You can see it. And it collapsed with a, with a bunch of... And I said, what's that? They said, that's I-35 West. We would have been on that bridge, and we would have been down in the Mississippi. And many people died, and there was a lot of death. But I heard the voice of God, get off, get off, get off. I wish I could tell you that there's times when the Lord warned me about things, warned me about things. And, I didn't, and I'll close here, but uh, the Lord told me not to build the house up on the hill. He told me not to. See, I wanted to get away from here. See, I'm living there in my house. Well, we got 700 people coming here. People, I mean, people knocking on my door at all hours of the day. I mean, 3 o'clock one morning, I heard something downstairs. I, I forgot to lock the front door. I come downstairs, and there's a family of three or four standing in my foyer. I mean, people just won't leave me alone. Even I put up signs, uh, uh, do not visit with, without, you know, when you got 700 people tugging at you. So I got to thinking, why well, I like these stupid geodesic domes, you know, and, and I got it in my head. I want to put one up and uh, up on the top of the mountain. And so I, I went up there only four miles away, and my wife didn't want a house up there. And I walked up there, and I walked the land, and I'm up there, and I heard the voice of God say this, don't buy this land. I heard him say it. I told my wife and kids, I'm not supposed to buy this land. But for three months, I kept begging God, God, let me buy that land. Let me buy that land. Let me buy that land. And one day he said to me, with great sadness, go ahead and buy it. See, he'll let you do. I built, that was the, I'm telling you, that was the worst decision I had ever made in my life. And it brought major tragedy. Because now, we're running up and down the hill. My wife wanted to be down here all the time. I'm letting her up there on the hill with the kids at times. And we had a little, our little girl, Naomi. And one day, I'm in prayer. And the Lord said this to me. He said, She's going to get hurt in her car seat. Don't leave her in her car seat. I start weeping, not making it up. I went to Kathy. I said, baby, whatever you do, somebody gave us a car seat. I didn't know that middle section was missing. It was missing. And I said to Kathy, whatever you do, don't leave Naomi in the car seat. She would, as she was cleaning that used car seat somebody gave to us, I could have bought a new car seat. Why didn't I? I don't know. But we, we, so she, she's crying over that car seat. Something's wrong. See, God is talking to Pastor. God is talking to Kathy. Didn't do it. So one day, I'm down here. Kathy's going to go up home. We had corn on the cob. We're going to cook. And a friend of mine, Jeff Wilson, calls me up and said, Hey, Mike, you want to go out to eat? And I heard the Lord say, No, go home and be with your wife and your kids. Now listen to this. I heard the Lord say, No. I hardened my heart. I thought, well, I've been eight, out with Jeff for a long time. So my wife and my kids went up to the hill. Naomi had fallen asleep, and they had her buckled in. So Kathy says, well, bring, bring uh, Naomi into the house, and uh, we'll peel the corn. And Kathy said to him, uh, and, and, and one of the kids said, well, she's asleep, Mom, unaware that she had been unbuckled. And so they went in the house, and they kept coming out to check on her. And they came out, and here she hung herself in the car seat. And you talking about all hell breaking loose? Children's services investigated us three times. It was a long battle, two and a half years later, taking care of her 24 hours a day. She finally went home to be with the Lord. None of that had to happen. None of it. None of it. But I didn't listen to God. God's not to blame. Word of blame. Now, aren't you good, God, for God's mercy and love? God, God, God is still there for you. But man, the things we go through because we just won't listen to God. So, Father, I pray tonight that not just those who are here, but those who have been watching online, that you would 
wake them up and cause us to begin to listen to what God is saying in Jesus' name. Story after story. How many of you know of, uh, who, who is the guy who used to speak for the Assembly of God denomination? C.M. Ward. So one, one winter, my wife and I are going home for Christmas. We get across the Chicago River, and then right afterwards, I heard about an airplane that came right after we home, and it went, it went down in the Chicago River, and, and it kind of skimmed the bridge. But C.M. Ward was catching a plane that very day out of, uh, out of O'Hare Airport. He's standing there, you know, during Christmas, the seats are all filled, and in his heart, he just like, I can't get on that plane. I can't get on that plane. And finally, they all boarded, and he's standing there, and one of the, one of the stewardesses said to him, Sir, can we help you? He said, Well, that's my plane. And they said, Well, why, why didn't you get on the plane? I don't know. I don't know why I didn't get on the plane. Uh, and then the plane it had a lot of ice on it, and it went down into the Chicago River. You know how many people said they were supposed to, on 9-11, they were supposed to be in that building when it got hit, the Twin Towers? There, there was one guy, his son, teen, <clears throat> teenager, he kept telling her, honey, um, you, you're going you're gonna to miss your bus. And it's like she didn't care. You're going to miss your bus, honey. Get on the bus. And she said, to dad, no, daddy, I want you to take me to school today. What do you mean take you to school? I, 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 get on the bus. No, daddy. And he could not get her on the bus. So he got a real attitude. But he got his daughter in the car. He said, okay, I'll take you. And as he's driving, he drops his daughter off. He turns on the radio, and the news came out that the plane hit the Twin Towers, and it would have hit in the office where he would have been. So he didn't know it, but his daughter heard God. Didn't know it was God. No, have Daddy take you to work today. I mean, story after story of things like that. There was another guy, he just... He, he went to work, he said, or a woman or a man, I don't know who it was, and I don't know if somebody should write a book about that. <laughs> Lord, are you talking to me? He, he goes, and she can't, get, she can't get out of her car. She's late for work. She just, I, I can't get out of my car. I don't know why I can't get out of my car. She was supposed to already be at work a half an hour earlier, and all of a sudden, she saw the plane come and hit the Twin Towers. And that area where she worked, and she would have been dead. We got to listen to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, help us now. Help us to be sensitive. Help us to hear what you're saying. Help us to respond. Help us not to harden our heart like Eli and like King Saul, like Belshazzar and so many others. Lord, help us not to harden our heart. Help us to respond. Help us to listen as you reach out, as you visit us, as you, as you speak to us, as you, you, you touch our lives. Because, Lord, you, you want to save us. You want to rescue us. And you want to help us in Jesus' name.